Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Engel. I'm head of strategy at One Cosmos, and we're here today to talk about how we apply identity proofing and passwordless concepts to new hires, you know, your employees and contractors that are coming in to our organizations at a record pace today. So uh, with that, let's jump in. Um, when we think about identity, uh, we like to use a term called identity-based authentication. And there hasn't been a whole lot of identity in our identity and access management systems really for years, for, for, you know, forever. And without identity, right? And identity is proving who somebody is remotely. We're relying on usernames and passwords, which you know every FIDO member and, and person out there knows that that's the goal to get rid of those things. But we end up relying on these other secrets and challenges to try to prove or guess what we call hope who somebody is remotely. And the way we've been onboarding new hires and contractors, et cetera, is really stuck in the 90s. We're using very old technology and concepts. And because of that, we have breaches, a horrible user experience. We don't know really who we're hiring at the end of the day. And we're just really starting our process into the digital life of a person the wrong way, right? And you know, ancillary to that is we're still relying on credentials. So um, this is some pretty fascinating stacks that come out of the uh, uh, Verizon latest data breach investigations report. I don't like to dwell on a lot of stats, but these are new. And, and this is from a 114 page report they put out uh, in the last month or two. And these can be useful for anybody who runs a security program or just has to evangelize security. And you can see social engineering is still at the top of the, of the way that bad guys get credentials because credentials are the, the golden goose. And, you know, not surprising, a human element is involved in these breaches, right? Either somebody making a mistake, getting fished, uh, or just otherwise being involved in it. We need to take that human element out of the picture. And um, one of the biggest impacts that the whole world has been exposed to lately is ransomware. And you can see the, the use of this. And double clicking into that a bit now, there's two stats I picked up out of this that I thought were really helpful. And that's business email compromise is skyrocketing in terms of the average and, and high end of that, as is ransomware. So these are some more of those uh, DBIR statistics. And I, I thought these are really powerful, right? These are from an actual insurance uh, uh, provider called Lockton. And you can see some truly staggering numbers here, right? An average ransomware payment of, of a million and a half and over $5 million in actual interruption, right? And again, we've seen this on the news, so there's no surprises, but this really helps get some visibility for the C-suite or, and the board is very much tuned into these numbers today. So enough of that, I'm not trying to create fear. We all kind of know how this stuff works today. We're here today to talk about the combination of passwordless and identity onboarding. Many companies today are moving in a passwordless direction, right? And what we're, uh, we're doing as an industry is trying to figure out a way to apply digital transformation to the entire life cycle of how a person interacts with their systems, right? So we have a uh, digital wallet that is what I call FIDO authenticator, right? That is a new credential that you have in part of the authentication process. We're extending that, not just we, but the industry in a way that now you can onboard people from a citizen perspective on day one, into an organization because it has to be done anyway. You have to prove who somebody is before you can hire them because the government says so. And then downstream, take that same exercise and turn it into a passwordless experience. And the benefits are uh, really uh, apparent. And you'll see how I drill into this here in a minute. Where we've seen lots of organizations go passwordless on day one is in the front door. So your VPN, remote access virtual desktops, right? The, the, all that, those remote access points, your operating systems, obviously Windows, Mac, uh, Linux being the big ones, and into your single sign-on gateways. So Fordruck, Octoping, Azure AD, on and on. Um, those, by tackling those three, you can cover somewhere between 60 and 80% of your passwords that uh, a user has to interact with in an organization very early in the process. So the strong authenticator that is getting very popular can also be used as part of the onboarding process, right? Now, the method that's been used, as I mentioned, stuck in the 90s, 
is when somebody goes through talent acquisition, they then must get onboarded. And what they'll typically do is work with HR. HR says, hello, Kate, please send me two forms of government uh, identity. I need to prove who you are. I have to do what in the US is called a 99 process. And so Kate will take a picture or scan it on her flatbed scanner and send it in, email, fax it, or some other archaic way. That's painful for Kate. She doesn't feel good about having to scan and email those documents, right? There's all kinds of PII challenges around this. And for the organization, it's just as bad, right? They don't want that PII floating around. And after this, the organization hasn't really proved that it's Kate, right? Somebody took a picture, sent some documents in, in this post, you know, COVID world that we're in, you're not expecting people to come to the office and actually meet the HR rep who could potentially hold documents, scan them, et cetera. So it has to be done digitally and done properly. So when do you do this? Proofing has become a very big business. Again, really digitally enabled because of COVID and unemployment claims and remote onboarding of bank accounts and crypto, et cetera. But let's apply that to the new hire process, right? So what we'll do is as we're setting up that strong mobile wallet for them, the same wallet that's going to be an authenticator into all those operating systems, we're going to leverage the same process, right? We give them a credential and that credential could be a, you know, a FIDO key, but let's also onboard a digital representation of their government credentials at the same time. By putting these two together, we now have cryptographic proof every time that they're authenticating that they are the same person that we hired because we're leveraging biometrics as well. So we'll take this process and then the demonstration of onboarding government credentials is a little bit out of the scope for this chat, just for the purpose of time. But these credentials are onboarded electronically, scanned, verified with a live selfie matching the images, et cetera checked with the authoritative sources, and now we're jump-starting jump starting the onboarding process with really the click of a button. At the same time, you can take a couple of extra steps because we're using a rich mobile experience. So as part of that, we can verify their location, right? The phone knows where they are. So it's not somebody who's two countries over, right? We can also verify their phone number, send them a text message, or maybe depending on the platform, actually verify that they have the SIM that you're interacting with from a name perspective. And then that live selfie, something that we call live ID, uh, can be compared to documents and be used as a strong authenticator downstream. Right? So the process of this is actually very straightforward. Um, we will send uh, the new candidate, you know, and we being IT, an invitation to the platform. You know, they, dear Kate, you need to start tomorrow. Let's get started. So they'll start the onboarding process of their digital identity by clicking this link. This link takes them to go fetch typically an app. And there's also ways to do it appless. But when you're working with employees and contractors, an app is, is typically the process that's done. And they will onboard their documents with a self-enrollment process. At, at uh, the time this is happening, we're doing all of the verifications like you see here on the screen, right? So the images match, um, the name matches the person that we're, we think we're hiring, and the status of the documents is that they're valid and overt security features are, are uh, validated, et cetera. Now, the transmission of that, if the way this is to be done with user-centric privacy first is the user has onboarded credentials into their digital wallet, right? This isn't sent to a central authority. There's no online database of that image, the documents, or any of the data that the user um, uh, does not control. So what happens is Kate is now prompted for consent to transmit her information into the HR uh, systems downstream, right? The way that's done is typically by scanning a QR code. It could also be done by uh, uh, entering their um, ID in a push message. But at the end of the day, you're engaging with them cryptographically Will they prove their identity one more time, unlock the, her data, and transmit it? So what we've done is replaced a photo, email, fax, scan, legacy process with something the user's in control of. The user uh, manages the cryptography and the consent of. And with the press of a button, 
this information is transmitted directly into downstream systems, right? PeopleSoft, Workday, uh, SAP, ADP, et cetera. HR has now, you know, uh, short-circuited their time to value here. The user's done all the hard work. The data has been validated. They still just have to come in, check it over, maybe type in a couple of attributes that don't come from citizen documents. And the data is now uh, front end loaded into these HR systems, which become the authoritative source for them to get into now their IGA process downstream, right? Um, now the flows of how this data comes together is you'll have a credential binding. So as part of this process, Kate is sent uh, a verification link, which again validates that she's still the same person. She clicked the link from her mobile phone and that binds her strong mobile authenticator with her cryptographic keys to the account that was just created in called Active Directory or whatever LDAP system is, is downstream, right? As part of the process, they may be giving uh, secondary certificates like a virtual smart card certificate to get into Active Directory resources. At this point, Kate has never had to know a username and password. She's been given a strong credential um, that she doesn't even really understand, need to understand how it works behind the scenes. And think about the difference in process from how this is done. Uh, so we talked about how a, a user will typically take a picture and send them in and somebody does double data entry. Uh, likewise, the old way of giving somebody a credential is typically an HR rep uh, calls IT or pushes a button and an account's created. Then a downstream line manager will have to call up the new hire and say, hey, Kate, welcome to the company. Your laptop showed up. Let me give you your username and password over the phone, right? Kate will have to change it on first login and then worry about all the hassles of 16 character complex passwords, et cetera. By doing it this way, the line manager is taken out of the picture. They don't have to be bothered. You're saving time, effort, and frustration there. And again, you're getting rid of a very important vector moving into that password direction, passwordless direction without even uh, um, having to interact with the user anyway. And I, I do wanna dive into a little bit about the security of this process. This is really important because anytime you're scanning uh, citizen documents and working with real biometrics, you need a way to keep this information secure. And so the cryptography that's at the heart of uh, the FIDO process, right? Public private key pairs is one of the key enablers here. So that cryptography makes sure that documents are secured and all data at rest and in transit is encrypted the way it's supposed to be. Um, the way we do it is we'll leverage uh, IPFS, which is a blockchain-based file system. There's lots of different ways to do this, but this is a key aspect of, you know, whatever supplier you're working with must uh, take care of that data at rest and data in transit security problem, right? And as a side benefit of that, what you're doing is setting up an infrastructure where nobody has access to the data but Kate, um, and so you're not creating a honeypot of credentials. So um, the main problem with password repositories, obviously, is that you could have one place for uh, one non uh, one stop shopping for bad guys to come in and get their um, uh, hashes that can be cracked. So there's two standards that tie all of this together. And the FIDO Alliance is, is heavily involved in both of these, right? So the NIST 863.3a standard is how you onboard identities. They have a level of assurance in them called IAL. So identity assurance level is how strong of an identity it has. And what this will do for you is prove who uh, an employee or customer, right? The same technology applies to any person, who they are and establishes identity. And it really answers the question, how do I prove who you are remotely? Typically involves two forms of government documents, identity documents, and a match to the real uh, biometric, like I mentioned before. So the NIST 863-3A standard is the identity assurance, and that's combined with the NIST 863-3B side, which is the authentication side of the standard. And there's a C side as well, uh, which deals with federation that we won't talk about today. But this is where um, FIDO2 lets you get to a strong authentication assurance level. It goes up from level AAL1, 2, or 3. And you can be FIDO certified up to AAL3. 
And what this does is establishes the proper uh, mechanisms for password list authentication. So how do I authenticate you? We get rid of the secrets and there's you know, lots of speakers talking about that at the sessions here, but a private key combined with a biometric is how this is done. When you put these two together, you have what we refer to as identity-based authentication, right? So it's a combination of these two that makes it very powerful. And there's a couple of standards bodies that are really important here that tie this together as well. You have the Cantera initiative, which certifies your identity onboarding, right? And so um, that's very important to, to see that process, understand it and get a certified provider. And second is, of course, the FIDO Alliance will certify uh, products from the FIDO2 perspective as well. And just taking this downstream, the benefits for your entire IAM platform is now these concepts that were typically siloed, whether you're dealing with employees or customers, can now be brought together. When they're separate, you have these fragmented, uh, expensive processes. So your identity proofing, if you're not doing it in a digitally transformed way, is a one-time exercise. You pay $4 a proof and you kind of throw that away. And now you're left with the other systems have to go figure out how to do the authentication side. Conversely, when you're authenticating somebody, wouldn't it be nice to come back and say, yeah, this person that's given me the secret key, the, the cryptographic proof, I know it's the same person that entered the government credentials last month or last year, whatever it is. So tying these together really becomes an enabler. And then both of those sources of truth can be fed into your fraud systems, right? Every organization has various levels of fraud detection. It's typically done more on the customer side, but we're seeing a lot more of it on the employee side as well, right? If they have signals, hey, fraud engine, I have cryptographic proof that this person gave me a driver's license or cryptographic proof that this person is AAL2 or AAL3 authentication assurance level. So let's lessen our fraud um, kind of friction that we may put a user through. So as you do this and tie these three together, you'll get what we call identity convergence, right? Your user authentication can be a source of truth for any CIAM or WIM platform. Same for um, proofing as well. And these in turn can feed down into your privilege access management, your SSO providers, um, the IGA process gets started, like I mentioned before, and signals can feed into that um, fraud detection as well. So um, in terms of when we onboard and when we proof, you know, we, we don't typically proof existing employees or existing contractors, right? They've already jumped through those hurdles and they were given a username and password uh, or, and 2FA. So we will convert them into a uh, password list and certificate-based process. So that's very straightforward. Basically, they'll have to just prove who they are one more time with that legacy form of proof, get into their existing account, 2FA, MFA, whatever it is, and give them um, a FIDO credential at that point. So you're kind of inheriting their identity assurance level in those examples, right? No existing employee is gonna to wanna to whip out their driver's license. However, you have that option. Right? Maybe before I let somebody and you know, in this new way that we're doing zero trust, come into my active domain, uh, you know, domain controllers or come in as root into any infrastructure. Maybe it's time to just proof them one more time and make sure they are the person that we thought we hired. But you definitely need to do it for new hires anyway and certain types of new customers, whether it's you know, uh, for KYC, AML type purposes as well. So for that, you'll put them through the NIST 863-3A identity assurance process and then hand them the credential, which very strongly links them together. So I'll just wrap up with the way um, I like to think about these new services being a critical piece in an IAM infrastructure diagram, right? Most large Fortune 100 type companies have 60 boxes on their IAM reference architecture. I tried to make something really simple here. So these services at the top represent your NIST IAL and AAL features that can, and the FIDO authentication, which can feed down into all of the systems and let them do what they do very well. They shouldn't have to worry about trying to prove who somebody is. So it's critical component. Um, and, and we're seeing lots of industry validation on this, not only from customers asking for it, but from analyst coverage and, and just other thought leaders that are starting to talk about this. Right. So that is the end of my piece. 
Uh, thank you for attending and uh, hope you're enjoying the rest of the show and uh, have a great rest of your day.